Morning. Morning. Uh, what a great day. It's sunny out today and uh, just uh, happy to be here. Happy to be in the house of the Lord with you. Welcome to Downsview Baptist. Um, today's service, we're going to start with a little bit more energy than, than I normally do. Uh, but it's two newer songs to the congregation. I feel, I feel you guys are very, very good at learning very quickly and on your feet. This church has impressed me the most at learning new songs. But even if it's too awkward or if it's a little, a little much for you to learn these songs, I'm sure you can move with this Holy Spirit and praise Him through your heart and, and through the words that are going to be up on the screen. But as soon as you catch it, you've got to join in and help us out. So I just want to have Akshay read our call to worship. Please stand with me as we just come in prayer and prepare our hearts for worship. Lord God, <clears throat> thank you that you would be mindful of us to, to set us free from being slaves to sin, free to love, free to make the right decision, free to honor you, free to worship you. God, we can't thank you enough, and we know that the cost of that freedom was your life. The life that should have been mine to be cursed to be thrown away and instead you did that for us and God we just thank you and there would be no freedom if the Holy Spirit didn't raise you from the dead and you were raised and you're alive today so that we may be alive in you and we just thank you for your grace through all of this that you would impart that onto us in Jesus name we pray <clears throat> up here. <laughs> That 
setting us free. Your sacrifice, your sacrifice has bought us our freedom and we can only thank you uh, for the rest of our lives. In fact, we'll be able to thank you. And we just ask that you bless the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, sir. The pastor has asked me to give the announcements today and then uh, lead in our congregational prayers. So, uh, uh, you'll notice at the table at the front, we have it set here, uh, and it's uh, we're after the service at, at noon, 12 o'clock, we want to have a newcomer's luncheon meeting. So if you've been coming to our church for a while, and you uh, wonder about certain things, this is the time to meet with us. You get free pizza, and uh, you can ask any questions. If you have questions about our church, about why we are called Baptists and not a community church uh, and things like that. So the newcomers luncheon at 12. And then uh, this uh, Saturday, we have a ladies, uh, do you call it a luncheon for the uh, ladies? Ladies breakfast, sorry. It's a breakfast, a ladies breakfast this Saturday at 10 o'clock. So all the ladies, and uh, this is gonna be uh, something that you need to come and see because the men are gonna serve. This is something new, you know. The men are gonna serve the ladies. Uh, you know, we get served at, at home. I, I have a, a daughter and a, and a, I have a, two, a daughter-in-law and a daughter, and they look after me real well in my old age. Bev and I are in our 80s, and so uh, they don't let us do very much, and we get, we get uh, mad sometimes because we, they, they don't let us do anything, but uh, they love us and they want to care for us in our old age. And so that's uh, this uh, Saturday at 10 o'clock, ladies, the men, if you can, are going to help in uh, serving that you can be here, uh, help at eight, if you come over at eight, we've got to do some things before the ladies get there to make it look good. So uh, don't forget that men, you'll be here. And so uh, those are uh, two of the announcements. And now we're going to think about prayer. Uh, we were uh, notified today that uh, Victor and Nina are not well, and they need our prayers. They're seniors like me and Bev, and uh, so they're not feeling well, and so we need to pray for them. And, you know, we need to pray for, for Johan. You know, people in the church that know, know Johan, he is uh, not well. His mind is not, and so he's been, he's been put in a hospital, and now he's waiting uh, to be put into a, a long current term care place. And so we need to pray for, for, um, uh, for Johan. So, and we need to pray, you know, we, we support Liberty Grace Church. And uh, so we, we need to pray for the Liberty Church. It's church planting, He's, it's a church plant. They've been, they're down by the CN Tower there in Liberty Village. And it's not easy. There's a, there's a turnover every year in, down in that uh, area. So the church is, uh, uh, Daryl Dash is the pastor. And so he's, uh, he's uh, you know, trying to make ends meet, but the Lord is providing. And uh, so uh, we need to pray for Pastor Dash and, uh, and Liberty Grace. And then we need to uh, pray for, you know, church planting. The, the uh, fellowship of churches, uh, Baptist churches is, uh, has a, taken on the, of, of planting as many churches as they can. So if you think about planting something in Toronto, if you came to Toronto and tried to buy a house, uh, you know, this is why uh, uh, pastors don't like to come to Toronto because they, the houses, say, I, I, I could not buy my house that I bought, uh, if you believe, 60 years ago. <laughs> we paid 18.3 and now they're they're selling in our neighborhood for over a million dollars. So I don't know how people can afford a house, but we need to pray for pastors that are being called into the pastorate in the Toronto area, planting churches. So 
Let's stand as we as we pray together. Let's stand as we ask God to uh, just be with us and guide us in every step of this service today. Father, we thank thee that we can come to you in prayer. We know that you're a sovereign God, that you're a God that knows things. We, we live in the right now, but uh, we don't know about the not yet. But our Father, you know the end from the beginning. You know everything. You're God. And uh, no one can tell you what to do or things like that. And so we come to you as a father. Those of us that are your children through faith in Jesus Christ, we come and ask you, our Father, to guide and direct us as a church family. We, pray, we think of our, our, our members. We think of those that are going to have surgery. I don't know whether, uh, whether Angie's had her surgery on her knee, but we just pray for Angie and for, for uh, some of our seniors uh, that are uh, waiting on surgery. We thank thee, our Father, that we can pray for each other. And so we just pray for Nina and Victor, our Father, in their senior years, Lord. There's, you know, when you get to that age and you not feel well, you... You just don't uh, know what, where to turn, but we thank thee for family. We thank thee for the, the Ivanovs and their love for their, their, her, their, their uh, grandparents. And so we, we just uh, realize every day, Lord, how much we need you in our lives. We thank thee that we can pray and ask you to intervene as only you can. And uh, we've been singing about being set free. Our Father, the Lord says when, when he sets us free, we're free indeed. We're free from the power of sin. We know that we do sin, but you say if we confess our sins, you're so faithful and just to forgive us. So our Father, help us to be a, a people of prayer. Help us to be a people of the word too. We, uh, we, we're endeavoring to, to teach our, our people and, and ourselves to read through the Bible in a year. And so we just pray as we take on these challenges from, from our pastor and from us as leaders that we'll just not just listen, but we might be hearers of the word, not just doers, but not just he uh, hearers, but doers of the word. So thank you, our Father, for being able to pray for things. We pray for unspoken requests. We pray for those that are here today that maybe have uh, requests that uh, only you know about. And so we just pray for those that are uh, contemplating things that we don't even know about. We think of our own son that's being welcomed into the uh, as a pastor of. Uh, Arendelle Bible Chapel today. We just thank you for David and his love for the word and his love for our church. Grew up here and uh, found uh, uh, baptized here and now serving you as a pastor in Mississauga. So thank you, our Father, for your working in our lives day by day. We just give this service to you and pray that as we lift up Jesus Christ, there might be those here that are outside his care and love might be drawn to him through your word and the Holy Spirit. So bless us now as we continue in your presence. We praise and worship you in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Now so we're just going to switch gears here for a sec. We sang about what God has done for us. Uh, whether you know or not. Sorry? Listen, you want to know. Oh, okay. You're not going to talk about me. <laughs> uh, when we lead worship, we try to to help the congregation, help our hearts, help ourselves first and foremost, understand what Jesus has done for us. And then in light of that, praise him. It's called going vertical. And so we're going to switch gears. And because of what Jesus has done to us, we just want to praise him and him alone. You, you give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. We'll sing that again. You give light. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring 
give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Jesus Christ, my 
my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silence the boats of sin and grace. Heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you, you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name of all name. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Oh, praise the name. Of the Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God, oh praise the name. We praise you. We thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. We just want to uphold you, your beauty, your majesty, your might. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I'll ask for the kids and the Sunday school teachers to come up to my right. As we pray for them, that the next generation may uphold and behold our Savior Jesus Christ so that one day they too will choose to live by Him, through Him, with Him, for Him. And so we pray for these teachers today that they are led by the Holy Spirit to do the activities that would grip their minds and their hearts that you, the Holy Spirit, work through them to open their minds, their hearts, and that one day they can call you King and Savior and call out your name, Jesus. And in his precious, powerful, and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Well, let me add my voice to my <clears throat> brothers and sisters to welcome you and to encourage you to enjoy the Lord throughout our service. You know, God uses his servants to write songs that express so much of what's in our hearts, doesn't he? And God gives musicians the talents to put appropriate music to those truths. It's not scripture, we know that, but God uses those truths to turn our hearts and our minds towards the Word of God. 
And we're asking him to do that even now. So let me encourage you, please, to take your Bibles and turn to the first book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father and gracious Lord Jesus, in the name and by the power of the Holy Spirit who gives us affection for you, I pray, dear God, that you would now focus our hearts and minds upon your truth. I pray, dear God, that the truths that we have sung would indeed affect us deeply at just that, at the affectionate level as well as the cognitive level. The things that our brothers prayed for, the things that our brother and sisters have sung about. Even, I pray, dear God, the conversations that we have had before this service began. I pray, dear God, that you would mingle all those things together to the end that Christ would become or deepen in being our most precious treasure in this world and frankly, as we look beyond this world. All of this is going to burn. It's all going to end. It's all temporary. Except our relationship with you and our brothers and sisters in Christ, where we will spend eternity praising that beautiful, powerful, wonderful name of Jesus. So now, dear God, as we seek to continue to grow together as a church family, as brothers and sisters in this local church and in the small C Catholic church, the universal church, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use your spirit to minister your grace to us now. And that as you use the Apostle Paul and his humanness to be led by the Holy Spirit to pen these words to the church at Thessalonica, I pray you would use those words now, dear God, to do what your son prayed would happen the night before he died, that you would sanctify us by this truth. And we acknowledge your word to be truth. We need you, dear God. Every moment we need you. And where we love you and obey you because we love you, dear God, we give you all the glory for it. Help us, I pray, this very morning, dear God, to be those who are deeper in love with Christ because of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is Super Bowl Sunday today, the 57th time that the Super Bowl has come together. Two teams, all the, what is there, 31 teams total, I think, down to 15 of them or so to make the playoffs, down through the uh, playoff rounds, and now we got two left. A friend of mine used to remark that, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody ends the season with a loss except one team. So it's not the losers that are uh, the ones that are unique, it's actually the one winner. Now whether you are a Super Bowl fan, whether even you're a football fan, frankly, whether you're a sports fan or not, this is affecting your life. It's all over the television set. It's all over the advertising. Some shows you might normally watch aren't on because the Super Bowl's there. Don't whine. It's worth watching. You can do it, girl. <laughs> there are more, more people that watch the Super Bowl than any other event in North America. And apart from the World Cup of Soccer, in the entire world, there's on, this is the, that's the only thing. The World Cup is the only sporting event that more people watch than this. Ten times as many people who watch the World Series... Ten times as many as that watch the Super Bowl. This is huge, magnificent uh, opportunity for two teams to go at each other that have been hard fought, who are looking to use all of their energy, all of their preparation in this one single game. The reality is that as they are in the locker rooms, as they have been living together for eight to ten months of the year, they basically play for six months and there's a couple of months of preparation, they are saying things like this in the locker room. They're looking apart or across at their teammates and they're saying, we are for each other. This game, we will protect each other. In fact, we will sacrifice ourselves in order to protect each other each other. There are 350 pound, 400 pound linemen who do nothing and get none of the glory except open a hole for the running backs and keep taking care of the quarterbacks, especially the quarterbacks. 
They lay down their physical preparation for that very purpose. Not only will they do that, they will call each other. We are here to take care of each other. Watch a football game. Look on the sidelines every once in a while, they will show you. There will be people just going at each other. Why didn't you do? Why weren't you there? Why weren't you blocking? Make sure you do that. We are here to take care of each other, and we will call each other to take care of each other. Are you listening to those kind of calls? And you'll realize pretty quickly that that sounds like the way you talk about your family, isn't it? You talk about those who are most precious to you in this world, your family. We will call one another to take care of each other. Parents, you've told your children, you make sure you take care of mom when I'm not around. Children have told their siblings, make sure you take care of mom and dad, they're, they're getting older. Make sure that we call each other to take care of each other. That as a family unit, we will care, we will protect, we will sacrifice for each other. Our lives are given to us so that the members of our family <coughs> far more than even a football team will be taken care of by each other. And I hope you're getting the connection. Because, dear friends, this ought to be how the family of God operates and cares for <clears throat> and sorry this ought to be how the family of God in the local church operates towards each other we should be at Downsview Baptist Church committed to the things Christ is committed to, and we've been saying for weeks, that means a commitment to Christ means a commitment to one another. That as the people of God, we will sacrifice, lay down our lives, protect each other. That's why we're here. That's what kind of church we want to be a part of, don't we? And so in the text this morning, the Apostle Paul comes to us and he gives us this action statement. We are called as brothers and sisters in the Lord <clears throat> to display his grace through our affections and our actions, through what we feel and through what we do, for what we think about and what we say, our affections and our actions towards one another. We want Downsview Baptist Church to be a place that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is on display by the way we take care of one another, the way we protect one another, that the Super Bowl teams would have nothing on this church by the way people care for one another in love. And so if you have your Bibles open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you use the Bibles in the pew, you'll find that there on page 1073, or the smaller print is on page 987. And as we continue to say, and people are continuing to do that, if you do not have a Bible and you would like one, please help yourself to the one in the pew. Is there a different page, Pete? 1173. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. I could back up and preach longer if I went the other passage, but thank you, Peter. 1173 and 987. And if, again, if you'd like one of those, you are very welcome to take that as our gift to you. Would you stand with me, please? And let's read from verse 9 to verse 12. The Apostle Paul writing his first letter to the church at Thessalonica. He says, now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For, or because, that's indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia and Achaia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and <clears throat> to aspire to live quietly 
to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we've instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and you may be dependent on no one. Amen. Please have your seats. It's important as we begin to think about this word. Because as many of you know, these are a couple of the Greek words that we know, right? Four different words for love. That there's eros, which is romantic love. That there's storge, which is actually family unit, biological family love. Agape, that's one of the words that we know, right? That perfect love of God towards us and in the inner Trinitarian relationships. And then this word today is the word philios or filio. That means brotherly love or the love of brothers and sisters in the Lord. <clears throat> this is the word when the Apostle Paul says, now concerning brotherly love, this is the word that he uses. It is the love by which Christians cherish each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's an important word, cherish. I've only found it used one other place in the scriptures. That's in Ephesians chapter 5 where husbands are told to cherish their wives. In the midst of that marriage relationship, there's this deep valuing. And this word brotherly love means that we are deeply valuing one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. The word philios is used elsewhere. It's used in 1 Peter 1.22. That having purified your souls for a pure love of the brethren. What? Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That one another is where Peter is writing to those who have this philios love. In Romans chapter 12, after, again, 11 chapters of some of the most dense, beautiful, Christ-exalting theology, where the Apostle Paul turns to action, he says, love one another with this brotherly affection. And outdo one another in showing honor. That's how we are called in light of the mercies of God. Chapter 1 to chapter 11 of the book of Romans. This is how we're called to love one another. In fact, in that very moving scene in John chapter 11. When the dear friend of Jesus, Lazarus, their brothers or their sisters, Martha and, and Mary. Where Lazarus was ill. And Jesus finds out. And he makes sure that before he goes to perform this incredible resurrection, it says there in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 5, Jesus loved, Jesus Phileos loved Martha, or loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was two more days, which sounds odd to us. In the Jewish culture, the idea was that the soul had not left the body until the third day. And so Jesus was saying, I'm not going so that you don't think he was sleeping or just really ill. That this was a real resurrection from the dead. He loved them so much to make sure they knew that the glory of God would be on display. This is where this word is used in the scriptures. And I ask us, brothers and sisters, and down to you and some of you are joining us and visiting with us today. Wouldn't you love to be loved like this? Don't you love to be loved like this? Because it happens in your life sometimes, doesn't it? You know folks are willing to sacrifice and lay down their lives to protect you and care for you and even call others to care for you far more than any Super Bowl football team, even often more than your own biological family. Not all of us have the blessing of our biological family being our Christian families. Some of us have a mix. Some of us have everyone, and most of us have that mix. Some don't have any at all. Some of you know what it's like to be the only Christian biologically in your family. And that this should be a place that you find deep, committed, brotherly, sisterly love one towards another. Don't we want to be that kind of church? Don't we love to be loved like this? And Jesus knows that. Jesus knows we like it, we love it. Jesus knows we need it. That's why he calls us to do it. So that's the kind of love we're speaking about. And so let's think about this for a minute. 
I'm not quite sure why this has happened, and I feel like in my pastoral ministry of almost 30 years, probably half of it, I started to hear this mumbling and murmuring amidst the body of Christ, or sometimes just from those outside looking in, that there's a problem with the body of Christ, that they're too inward focused, that they love each other too much, that they take care of each other as too much of a priority, and they don't think of anyone outside the church. Now, surely, the church can do better at outreach and evangelism and thinking of people who aren't yet part of the church, and we would love them to be part of the church. Some of you may be here today. And make no mistake, that is a beautiful goal that we have, that Christ would bring all of his sheep into the sheepfold. There'll be one sheepfold and one shepherd. But there's something odd that happened with an emphasis to care for those outside the church as well, it became outside the church instead of those within the church. And people started being feeling a little bad and a little awkward that they were caring for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ too much. In fact, people didn't just start to feel awkward, they started to get scolded, sometimes scolded from within the church almost to the point that there was something wrong. And people started to apologize. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, we're not looking outside, we're taking too much effort to take care of our family. And before we knew it, the world, the flesh, and the devil just turned this thing on its head. Instead of saying, as well as, let's do a better job there also, we stopped loving those deeply from the heart within the body and simply focused on folks outside. And you've heard me do the math before. That people come to the church and the most excitement we have, the thing that we're most enthusiastic about, the one that everyone wants the pastor to speak to or the leaders to speak to or make sure we make, it's the visitor. Of course we want that as well. What happened, it was instead of. And so folks within the church started looking around and going, I've been in this church for decades. And they're only excited about the new person coming through the door. Gee, you know what? If I didn't come for three or four months, I would be a big deal. And so people stopped doing that. Hey, welcome back. We're so glad you're here. Oh, good. Now again, do you see how, how sick this can be with sin? We're not talking instead of, we're trying to say as well as that we should simply stop apologizing for taking care of those within the body. How would that work with your kids? You look at your children, one child is feeling a bit neglected. You say, okay, Joey, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop paying any attention to young Sarah. There, now you're even. How would that go over? Yes, yeah, sweetheart, you're right. I'm paying too, attention, too much attention to everyone else. I'm not going to pay attention to them or you. We'll be in the marriage counseling class in no time, right? This, this, this sin sickness that happens, that the pendulum swings so far away from hearing the book of Galatians as we preach through, to do good to all men, yes, to everyone, especially to those of the household of faith. Indeed, especially. We want the deeper we go into relationship here at Downsview Baptist Church, the more loved you feel. The deeper intensity of our relationship, the better you enjoy it. The more content you feel. The safer you feel. The better it is. This ought to be, as Charles Spurgeon said, the dearest place on earth. And perhaps... We can help with a bit of focus that the pendulum could swing a little more to look around our church on Sunday and say, we want those who are new to feel welcome. Hey, we're having pizza and drinks afterwards, right? We want folks to feel welcome now. We want them to integrate into our church, for sure. And we want to look around and think, boy, the veteran saints who have been around here, we want you to know that Christ's grace is on display as we love one another deeply from the heart with this kind of filios, brotherly love. So it's a bit of a long introduction. Let me take you to the first thought here. And I put them all in action phrases so that we can put them into action. 
display brotherly love in the way that we've been taught. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9, display brotherly love in the way that we've been taught to. Meaning, love for your family, and from this point on in the sermon, local church, brothers and sisters of the Lord, I'm just using the term family. For love for your family should exhibit how you've been taught to love. The way that we love one another should show that we're doing it the way we've been taught to love. Isn't that what he says? Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been what? Taught by God to love one another. Display his grace in the way we've been taught. The first thought is God expects us to live what we have learned. Is that ridiculous? Is that nuts? God actually expects us not just to be hearers of the word, but live it out. Come on, Lord. I'm busy. There's lots going on. <laughs> Sometimes you would think that all Christianity is is this cognitive scholarly exercise that we take in the word of God and then we just live like we always lived. No, no. Jesus expects us to live what we have learned. He expects us to put it into practice. And this, this is his first thought. Not what I've conceived... Not how I've conceived to love, but what I've received. The instructions I've received from the Lord. That, that not that I make up, I think the best way to love you would be like this. You do not need my opinion in terms of how to love you. We don't need one another to make it up. We need to go to the one who loves us greater than we love ourselves. And has been gracious enough to teach us through his word, in fact through his spirit, how to care Deeply in filios love one for another. Not the way I've conceived it, but the way I've received it. And I should do it, number one, because of the one from whom we've learned it. Because this is the Lord Jesus over my life. <clears throat> I'm taking Jesus at his word. That Jesus actually knows what he's talking about. That he knows what I need and he knows what you need from me. Because of who has given me this, who my teacher has been, I'm going to live what I've learned. In fact, isn't that what, all the way through the Old Testament scriptures, as Isaiah and Jeremiah look forward to that magnificent new covenant, the better one, the other one, the one that will replace the old one. Looking forward, he says, what's going to happen then? All your children shall be taught of the Lord. And be great, and great shall be the peace of your children. God is going to have this inner testimony of the Holy Spirit coming. Jeremiah, 100 years later, in this incredible passage of Scripture, in chapter 31, about this new covenant. This is the new covenant I will make with the house of Israel. What will I do? I'll put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. They don't have to be taught from somewhere else. I'm going to write, I'm going to impress it upon them. Then no longer will they have to teach his neighbor or te teach his brother saying, Know the Lord. That's not what's going to be required for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them. He says, I want you to live what you learned because of the one from whom you've learned it. And because of the one whom we claim to love. Now, both of those are Jesus. You see there's a different emphasis? Jesus is the one who has taught us. And we say Jesus is the one that we love. And since we love him, we will keep his commandments. That's why we'll live this. Because Jesus says, that's what people who love me do. That's what I cause people who now have been caused to love me. That's what I cause them to do. That's what happens in that new heart that Jesus gives us when he saves us. There's actually new desires in there. New affections for Christ. The Christ for whom we, or to whom we say, Lord, what will you have me to do? I would love to do what you would love me to do. And since I love him, I will seek to keep his commandments. Because of that, I will seek to do what he's called me to do. He calls me to live what I've learned. And secondly, he expects us to live what we've learned. The first emphasis was on the fact that we've learned it. The second emphasis is on the content. 
what it is we've actually learned. And when we love the way Jesus has taught us, and we know that amongst us, you know what happens? Expectation. Brothers and sisters expect to be loved by us. Don't you feel that? Okay, I know you feel that. <laughs> because listen to what happens when you're not loved the way you think you should be loved. <laughs> Do you know what she said to me? Do you know how they treated me? Do you realize what's going on? We need to have a meeting. We need to have a conversation. I was not treated the way... See what happened? We have an expectation to be loved by one another. And that's good. We should have that expectation. We have an expectation that we should live what we've learned. And the content of what we've learned is loving one another deeply from the heart. 1 Peter 1.22 that you don't need anyone to teach you about brotherly love. That's what you're doing, Paul says. So the brothers expect us to be loved. And frankly, we ought to expect then to be helped by each other how to love each other. Sometimes I've heard that the mark of love is omniscience. Omniscience means to know everything. Omnipresence, God is present everywhere. Omniscience means knowing everything. Somehow the mark of love is I know everything about you, everything you desire, whenever you desire it, in precisely the way and the quantity and the color that you'd like it. Because if you love me, I shouldn't have to tell you what I need. Ever heard that? You've said it. We've said this. If you love me, I shouldn't have to tell you. You hear that when you bought the wrong Christmas present? You blew it on the first day present? Got a chance on Valentine's this week, guys. <laughs> you know you didn't get the right thing. You didn't get the right color. And someone is saying, look, it just doesn't work. And I say, well, what would you like? What, what do you need? I, I'm not sure what you'd like. If you love me, I shouldn't have to tell you. How is omniscience the mark of love? <laughs> it may be part of the character of the one who is agape loving, our Lord himself. But friends, if we expect to be loved by each other, I expect you to help me. The great theologian Tom Cruise was right. Help me to help you. Right? Tell me. Help me to understand what this is like. Instead, there seems to be this requirement to guess. And you better guess right. Then there seems to be this entitlement to gripe. Because I didn't get what I wanted and I'm not going to tell you how to do it. And then there's this liberty to gossip because we tell everyone else, right? What they didn't do for me. Brothers and sisters, we need guidance one to another. We want to live out loving one another the way Jesus has taught us. Jesus expects us to do that. And we want people to expect that, but I expect you to help me. You've got to help me. We have to help each other to know how to do this. Just get right by all the griping and gossiping, all this sense that I have to guess right. Let's just get right down to the point and say, okay, how do we understand? And that's what it's going to take, isn't it? It's going to take deeper understanding of one another. And you know the way that we're going to deep, more deeply get to understand each other is to be deeper in relationship with each other. And the people that you are going to care to do that for are people that you love. See how it goes full circle? That you, you apply this command to love one another deeply, that you apply this command of loving one another in this filios way. And I will get to know you better. And I will understand you better. And I will know how to love you better. And I'll be equipped to do that. Isn't that how it goes with Jesus? <clears throat> I want to know how to live to please the Lord Jesus Christ. I have to care enough about him to get to know him. I have to get inside his mind. And he gives us that in those words. Everything we need for life. Life and God likeness, godliness, is been given to us. We've been taught by God how to do this. Taught by God how to do this towards God. And we take it from Him. 
When we say, Lord, I'm desperate to love you the way you need and deserve to be loved. Help me. And he says, I'll show you. Here it is. Help me to do it. He says, I'll help you. I'll give you my Holy Spirit. And I'll give you my Holy Spirit because in order to love me, you're going to love one another. Anyone who says they love God does not love his brother. What does John say? The truth is not in him. That person is not telling the truth. That person's not mistaken. That's a lie. I think I can love God without expressing deep filios love for my brothers and sisters. That's his expectation of us. So display the grace of God by brotherly love towards one another, yes, in the way we've been taught to. Learn, live what we've learned and learn, live what we've learned. Secondly, display love so that it will not only be taught or the way it's been taught, but that it will be caught by others. One of the reasons we have our children in the church service for a while before we dismiss them because some things are better caught than taught. Right? Or one way that things are taught is that they catch them. They pick up on them. What the Lord is saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, love for your family must be exemplary for others. That others will catch it. They don't just need to hear it or be taught, but they'll pick up on it. That's what we mean by earlier in this same letter. This is how Paul began to commend them for their example. Look back at chapter 1, verse 6. That you, members of the church at Thessalonica, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. That means Paul was an example for them. And they imitated him and the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Just for the record, Macedonia is a bigger province. Achaia is another area close to that. Thessalonica is a city. So when he says the believers in Thessalonica, that's Toronto. And all the believers in Macedonia, Ontario. That's the parallel. And so, if you come back, he says, your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. We don't need to say anything. He doesn't have to be taught. It's going to be caught. Other people are going to see it without us saying it because your example is going to be so powerful. So back to chapter 4 and verse 9. Now concerning brotherly love, we have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for indeed that's what you're doing. To all the brothers throughout Ontario, throughout Macedonia. He's saying, all these folks are hearing about and recognizing that you love Christ. And your example is going out all over the place. It came from Jesus. His instruction went to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul brought that instruction and brought it to the city of Thessalonica. And from the city of Thessalonica, it went to the entire province of Macedonia. Do you see how that works? And there's that ongoing, Paul is continuing to bring his teaching into the city in Thessalonica. And it continues to melt out and grow like a ripple effect of throwing a stone in the water. It just goes farther and farther and farther. And the wonderful thing about this example is it's actually an example of this. You see, they're loving one another. If you notice in chapter 1, verse 8, he says, that's an evidence of your faith. And that faith is evidence that you've received the Word. And the Word instructs you to love one another deeply. And as you put that Word into practice, again, the evidence of your faith that is growing and being caught by other folks. Because the Word of God continues to go out. And it's this beautiful cycle of what the power of this example actually is. So brothers and sisters, do not discount the impact of your example. For to display God's grace in a way that it will be caught as an example for other people, then do not, don't discount the impact of the example of your life. And yes, sometimes we say, live an exemplary life. And we mean by that, we mean by that live a good example. 
Right? Give a positive example. Be a good example for your children. Be a good example. But you know that what he's saying is you're going to be an example. You may not be a good one. You might be a bad one. You may be a good one and a positive one. Your example is going to be set. Your life is going to say something about Jesus to the world around you. And in particular, to this church family. There's something about my life that is going to say something about Jesus, whether it is positive or whether it is negative. And it will be either introducing something for the first time, or it will be reinforcing something in a glorious way. Frankly, as I was looking at that this morning, I thought that's really what I do when I try to preach. Either I'm introducing something new that you haven't thought of or heard before or applied it in a certain way, or we're reinforcing a truth that we celebrate and we glory in and we love and we deepen in our affection for it. Isn't there some connection there that we recognize that our example, like it or not, we're setting one. Positive, negative, negative introducing something or reinforcing something and our example is going to be both observed and absorbed I know I can feel in our still yet to be fully sanctified hearts pushing back saying I don't live my life for anyone else it's just between me and God no you don't you're not well that's all I'm trying to do fair enough but that's not what's happening People are observing our lives. They are absorbing from our lives. What does my example this morning say about Jesus? Every single one of us should be asking that question. Because every single one of our lives is saying something about Jesus. Just by example. This is not the taught, this is what's caught. And folks are absorbing that. <clears throat> Steve and I were talking before and we said, you know, we, we pray for the children and we're trying to think about the, the methodology and why we're doing that. And part of that is for us to recognize as a church family that we are responsible for these little sponges. Not just the parents who are overwhelmingly primarily responsible, but as a body of believers united together in Christ, we are responsible for those that God gives us. Because they're absorbing our example. You see that when your parents all the time and grandparents. And I know you can see it at the church. Sometimes you hear it at the church. I hear Skye's voice. I hear Matthew's voice. It's like, there it is. They're absorbing it, right? They're observing their parents. They're observing the church. I could hear it. They're absorbing the beautiful example. It's not just taught, they're catching that, right? Before you know it, they grow up and they're 20 years old getting baptized him. <laughs> Started when they were young. There's examples that are being observed and absorbed. So brothers and sisters, consider the gift of your years of influence. Yes, with your own family, but particularly with our church family. Consider... What a blessing it is that we have the opportunity to influence, by example, others for righteousness, for good, for living. So don't discount your example and don't disregard the opportunity. Don't disregard the opportunity. Don't just hope that an opportunity comes. You have an opportunity every time we meet together, every time we connect as the, as the Lord's people. Don't disregard it. Seize it. Often the fact is your words are going to be more questioned than your works. By that I mean your example is not nearly as likely to spark a conversation with someone as what you actually say to them. Right? Here's what I'm doing and you have a conversation and people may interact but they're watching. I wonder why he lives where he lives. I wonder why they chose that profession. How come their kids are doing so well? I wonder why that's going on in their life. I wonder why they've made that choice. I, that's not the choice I made. I wonder if I could learn from that. Sometimes in intimate relationships, we talk to people like that, right? 
But you need to understand that it's far more often our words than our works that are going to be questioned. And so don't disregard that opportunity to set the example that we're trying to set. And be, brothers and sisters, keenly aware of what we are teaching by example. Part of that is we have to wrap our arms around the reality that we're going to do that, that we're going to set an example for one another in love. But don't discount the impact of your example and don't disregard the opportunity God gives you to set one. And then we're going to pick up the next two points next Sunday. And I want to encourage you, friends, with the fact that the evidence of grace, of the display of God's grace, happens week upon week upon week at our church. I love noticing and picking up the example of living in a way that pleases God that I see from you. I know that people talk very positively about one another at our church. About what's going on and the growth and how God is at, at work here. And we have much to be grateful for. But to understand, brothers and sisters, that it is an, not just an opportunity, a glorious, joyful, but it's an obligation. An obligation for us to recognize that we want the display of God's grace to be what's happening in the love, the affection, and the actions that we have for one another here. That this is not just the gravy. The body of Christ is intended to be knit together this way. God has knit us together this way. Remember the, the many analogies he uses? He calls us living stones in a building. And you pull the wrong one out and everyone is affected. That's why we pray for people in our church. They're not well. They're, not, they're, they're, they're sick. They're having difficulties in their relationship. Some very tragically. We all feel that when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. And, and there's varying gifts and varying opportunities that we have to serve with one another. <clears throat> Friends, the call of the text this morning is that we would seize that. Eagerly seize that. Passionately seize that. Earnestly desire to set the kind of example that will help, yes, from the smallest children to the most veteran saints among us. That we would display the grace of God the way we've been taught to. And we would display the grace of God in a way that others will catch it. Hang on to it. And enjoy and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, would you stand with me please? Let's close our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is our great joy to be with you again this morning. To be in this place singing your praises, singing of the wonderful, beautiful, powerful name of our Lord Jesus. And I pray this morning, Heavenly Father, for an outpouring, outpouring of agape love to us <clears throat> that would overflow in filios love one to another. We, dear God, know something of a little taste of what it is to be loved <clears throat> the way you've designed us to be loved and to desire to be loved. We want, Heavenly Father, <coughs> for our joy to find its completeness in our relationship with you and so much of its expression in our relationship with each other. I pray, Heavenly Father, especially for those who are hurting today. For those, dear God, who yearn so deeply to be cared for so completely. And I pray that you, the perfect one who loves so perfectly, whose love was displayed most precisely on the cross, where you demonstrated your love in this, that while we were yet sinning, Christ died for us. And I pray, dear God, that as we receive that and we comprehend it, 
that we would live it out in a way that pleases you and that cares, protects, sacrifices, and even calls others to care and love and protect and sacrifice for one another towards one another. Thank you for your grace this day. And I pray even as our newcomers stay behind to learn more about our church, that it would be setting deep the pillars of commitment, pillars that are deeply planted in the cement of God's love as it were. We thank you for your care for us. We ask, dear God, that you would cause us to love, to love like this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're dismissed, friends. If you're able to stay for a little newcomer's time, about 10 minutes, we'll be right up here down front where we'll have the tables and the pizza set up.